All right, we are live, gentlemen. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining the panel. I'm joined by some extremely um, prestigious and hopefully experts in their field guests um, from across the world. Um, today's topic is embracing social capitalism. Uh, the brief, as Frank has sent to us and as we will be discussing, is that the COVID debt pandemic and the Ukraine conflict has revealed the shortcomings of capitalism. Capitalism can be redesigned if the whole world agrees to be more socially oriented and inclusive. The question to our panelists then is how to ensure that markets grow for the benefit of all, supporting the environment, and including social responsibility. And also, how can businesses and political leaders untake this reorientation and transition toward social capitalism? Now, before we get completely started, we're waiting for one more panelist who's joining us shortly. There's some technical difficulties, but I'm going to ask everyone present um, on the panel to just oh, briefly introduce themselves in one or two minutes. Oh, David, excellent. Um, uh, David, I've just introduced the topic, and now I'm going to ask each and every one of you to introduce yourselves in hopefully 60 seconds, um, and then we'll get to the, the questions and the topic at hand. Why don't we start with Graham, and then we'll go around the room. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Graham Kendall. I'm the CEO of the GCF, Good Capitalism Forum, and hopefully we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through this session. Um, I've been with the Petra Group for about 15 months, um, and I've lived and worked in Malaysia for about 11 years. Prior to this, I was heading up a university in Malaysia, so I was an academic for about 20 years, and then before that I was in industry for 17 years. So I'm now back into industry, um, but with a very much sort of, it's not an academic stance, but very much looking at how we can introduce social capitalism into the businesses that we run in the Petra Group and hopefully spread that word to other other companies and other countries around the world. So that's, that's my role and we can talk more about how we're going to do that as we go through this session. Thank you for the brief and hopefully everyone else is brief in their introductions. Um, shall we um, skip forward to David and then keep going? So David, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Cod. Hi, everybody out there. Uh, my name is David Hashim. I'm the founder and president of the Veritas Design Group. We are a um, des design architectural and design firm uh, globally. We have eight offices worldwide, and we are headquartered in Kuala Lumpur as well, like Graham and Dr. Vinod. Um, we are architects, planners, interior designers, landscape architects, anything to do with the built environment uh, is what we do. And we're a company that uh, has a very strong sense of uh, core purpose and core values. And that's why I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, Cod. Thank you so much. Um, next, uh, Lord Woolley, would you please introduce yourself? And Good, good, morning. good morning from uh, Cambridge in the UK. My name's Lord Simon Woolley. I head Hamilton College at Cambridge University, the largest numerical uh, college uh, in, in Cambridge. And I have the honor of being the first black man to ever head the Oxford or Cambridge College. Um, I'm interested in the subject for, for a number of reasons. I think as you outlined, the, the pandemic showed societal fault lines in our commerce. And I think that if we are big enough and strong enough to look at and acknowledge uh, these gross inequalities, and reset our businesses, reset how we operate capitalism to be more socially inclined. I think we get better business and even better society, co cohesive society. That's why I wanted to be involved in this conversation. Excellent. And last, but certainly not least, actually we have one more panelist who has not joined at all, but um, I hope we can jump in. But um, Vinod, at, in, also in Malaysia, um, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, of course. My name is Vinod Shekhar. I'm the uh, chairman and chief executive of the Petro Group. Um, I, uh, we're, a, we're a technology and innovation-based conglomerate. Um, we're into uh, sustainable energy, recycling, uh, modular building, um, media, uh, and vanilla uh, processing globally. Um, and uh, we have a very aggressive foundation program and an institute. I am a, a believer in what I've defined, but what we call social capitalism. I consider myself a social capitalist, uh, and which we'll talk about more, but I, I as as Simon has said, and as David was talking about, I believe that the future requires 
uh, economic leaders to become social capitalists, where we bring um, societal development and business leaders together. Um, simply put, business leaders can no longer ignore the uh, society's needs. Societal development cannot be independent of commercial progress. They have to work hand in hand uh, and benefit each other. Uh, but I'm sure we'll get into, <laughs> into more details as we speak. But, uh, but I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. I'm glad that social capitalism has, has become a, a major issue. Hey, hey. Um, thank you so much for all our panelists for keeping their introductions brief. I know we've had previous introductions that lasted 20 minutes. So thank you everyone for their cooperation in that regard. Um, allow me to play the role of a good moderator by sort of challenging everyone who else on this panel who seems to be sort of on the same page when it comes to social capitalism. Now, capitalism has been the system of economics that has moved over the last 200 years, um, moved the most number of people out of poverty and into what we can now call the middle class and the upper class that, you know, in, in the, over the course of human history. It, there is no argument that capitalism is the main driver of social mobility, of, of, um, of improving the standard of living across the world, whether from the industrializations of the West to what we see in China now. Um, that being said, then the question is, is capitalism as it is all that bad? The floor is open. Well, can I, can I just kick off? Yes, please. My friends jump in as they like. Well, let's be honest. It's just a definition of capitalism, right? Sure. To me, sure. true capitalism is sustainable wealth creation. That's all it is. Okay. Um, you, you, you can have, you know, we, we've seen other forms of what they define as capitalism where they just gouge at the trough. There's, there's nothing given back. Now, the, the reason it's it has to be sustainable is that if you don't lift people up and you just cannibalize your own market, it will eventually implode and nothing is left. That's not capitalism. True capitalism is sustainable wealth creation. I'm a, I'm a businessman. How do I make money? I sell you a service or I sell David a product. How do I make more money? I need more of you. I need Simon. I need Graham. I need, you know, I, I need more people. So I have to play a role in lifting people out of poverty into the middle class to grow my market, to make more money. You see, I want your money, but I need you to have it before I can take it from you. Okay, so I have to play a role in, in, in lifting people out of poverty and pushing the middle class to ensure that my business grows and they will do the same as they go across. Now, that's true capitalism. And to me, that's social capitalism. My view on this card is that if you look at the, the, the curve of how capitalism has changed the world and its uh, positive effect, certainly it has, of course, but it, like any arc, it starts to get to a point where improvements are incremental. And I think the whole uh, progress of, uh, of capitalism in the beginning, when it was hectic, when it was uh, chaos, you know, everyone was like uh, Vinod was saying, uh, you know, gouging at the trough because everything was to be made quickly, quickly, quickly. But as the arc has begun to moderate, as, as we look back on the effects of what we have done and not all positive, we begun to realize that we need to tweak capitalism. It's not what it was in the 1920s and when the and the oil barons or the railroad barons or the pre during the industrial revolution when the textile barons in the UK when it was all about getting things done fast and quick and making as much money as you can we've seen the effects now and that's why the the I think the next phase the next era uh, of uh, capitalism will be this um, because it as as Vinod has said it the, the the sustainability aspect is now front and center. I, I, I would argue. I would argue again that we we need no more to look at the COVID nineteen global pandemic, and and there you see capitalism at its best and at its worst. At its best, it created a a vaccine in unprecedented time that potentially saved or you know did save millions of lives. And at its worst, that capitalism of great creativity said, you can have it, but you can't. And, you know, we can, we can do great things. And this is a clear illustration of that. But then we see that capitalism says, 
I just want it for me. I just want to save our people. And we're bigger than that. We're better than that. And so I would argue that that if my interest here is also in the interest in Africa and Asia and poorer and poorer countries, that when we have this creativity, we have to share it. Uh, we have to spread it. We, we have to have a DNA, a DNA that says social capitalism means unless we're all benefiting from it, then none of us are truly benefiting. And some of those who are at the sharper end, extreme poverty that, that create local and national conflicts, eventually spreads to the wider sphere too. So it's almost in our self-interest uh, to get this right. Excellent. Graham, do you have anything to add to that? God, at the beginning about capitalism has risen, you know, made society better. I think that's true, but there's, I think it's also made the richer richer and the poorer poorer. So there's a widening gap. Um, and I think the idea of, or my view of social capitalism is that we need to reach down, if that's the right way to put it, into you know, the people that are poor and, and raise them up. If you look at some of the tech industries, you know, that suddenly there were billions where, you know, Fortune 500 companies took, well, never actually got to where they were and tech companies can get there in a, even a matter, matter of months. One of the initiatives that we're trying to drive forward is that we want companies to embrace social capitalism and when they make money then put something back in and we don't want them to do it in a csr way or even an esg way it's got to be more than that it's got to be tangible and one of our ideals and it might take you might never do it but it will certainly take years to do is i liken it to drink driving in the uk 20 30 years ago it was wrong but it wasn't socially unacceptable now drink driving is socially unacceptable if you get caught drink driving in the uk no one has any sympathy for you quite lately. And social capitalism would be the same. If your company isn't operating on social capitalist principles, then the punters out there shouldn't give you the time of day. They shouldn't use your services because they can see you're just in it for the money, not for the, um, you know, not just to, um, they're in it for the money, not to help, not to help the social, you know, welfare of people. So that's where I see social capitalism. And it's got a there is a big disparity between the richer and the poor, and we've got to address that. I think I'd okay. like to okay. add to what Graham just said, just briefly. You know, sure. he's right. Sure. We just got to stop the box ticking exercise. You know, CSR has become just a purely box ticking exercise. I have a thousand saplings. I'll dump a thousand saplings by the roadside, by this forest. Okay, that's a thousand plants I've, I, I've planted. I'm giving, I'm giving my staff t ten minutes a week off to go, you know, to go see an orphanage and come back. And that's my, you know, we, that it's got to stop. We've got to make this a part of the DNA, part of uh, of the soul of the company, and I think that's that's where we've got to get to. But the key is, it, it's not it's not really a sacrifice. If you if we can measure, we can temper greed and measure for long term. It's we're, we're the real beneficiaries, and I think it's getting that across. You know, it, it's getting the idea that profit is also seen as something beyond cash, mm -hmm. right? That there is profit beyond cash, and it does it does increase the value of a company. And if we can get that straight across, let me talk in pure commercial capitalist terms. If we can get that across analysts and, and, and uh, fund managers and, and the big funds, uh, hedge funds, etc., to say value companies beyond cash, then they look at a company that, you know, made 100 million but gave, you know, used 10 million to, to improve their community, improve their work, workers' uh, compensation for health care or for education, and so made 90 million. They have a PE of 10, so they were 900 million normally. Uh, and, and if they say, no, no, we value this. And so the PE goes to 15. Right. So all of a sudden, although they made 10 million less, the value of the company has gone multiples of that. Uh, and I think if we can get that going, because we have to play with human nature as well. We can't just set aside the, that, that part of things. And that part of things is value creation. People want to see that value. So we need all these people to play a role. Uh, to show the real value of companies that make a difference. Because there is value. It is profit. If you make a community stronger and healthier, it is profit. Uh, and I guess, and I, I guess from my point of view, as an educationalist uh, here at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, I, I want to, clearly I want to nurture 
uh, academic uh, excellence. And many of the people from this, this college, this university, will go out into high-flying jobs. But we're trying to create a culture that says, we want you to be good citizens to do extraordinary things in the world. So when you are, when you are captain of industry, that you're having this uh, uh, the social capitalism mindset that said it's not just about profit. It's about how we fit in the community, how we fit in society, how we look after our staff, how people have the opportunities. We think that actually that in the end, you become a stronger company. Mm. You have a place in which your employers really look forward to going to work because of the environment that you're creating, that not just for the company, but but for but good be beyond that. Now, I, th I think with the, the things about capitalism, Cod, is that is that it's a team in place, it's a team in place of creativity that needs to be better harnessed, and uh, this thinking needs to be part of the DNA. At the moment, at best, it's probably an add-on. Oh yeah, we've made lots of money. Uh, can we give a few crumbs over here and pat ourselves on the back? Come on, come yeah. on, come on, business leaders, come on, educationalists, come on, policy policy gurus. Uh, bring that creativity, bring, bring that, bring that dynamism to a higher calling. I'd like to share three observations with everybody on this topic. Um, so I've been a, a leader of a corporation for the last uh, three and a half decades. And there's a few things I've observed very clearly that have changed. Uh, the first one is that change leadership has migrated from government-led, central-led, authoritarian-led, to led by companies. The mantle of responsibility has slowly shifted. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, and positive change in society, which used to be, you know, headed by ministries or government uh, funded think tanks, have now shifted to corporations. Um, and it's very clear, you know, and some corporations, as we know, are bigger and more influential than governments, uh, than some governments or even governments in their own constituency. And I'll give you three very clear examples. You know, when, when Donald Trump uh, withdrew from the Paris Agreement, there were many U.S. companies who said, well, we're not going to abide by that and we're going to continue with our uh, pollution reduction, automotive uh, processes or, or whatnot. You know, and even what happened with uh, ExxonMobil, uh, which was uh, stunning, stunning that they would make such a reversal despite a president, you know, banging at the top for a different direction. And of course, the, the Ukraine crisis is another example where even where countries have not... Um, taken a position, companies in those countries have taken a clear position. Right. And, and that's amazing. In fact, in some cases, thwarting the opinions of the leaders of those countries. And, and, and ESG, the whole ESG paradigm uh, movement is, again, it, it wasn't something conceived by some ministry of uh, unity or whatnot or ministry of uh, finance. It was conceived by business leaders around the world. So there's the change. We are now, as corporate leaders, taking on more of this mantle of responsibility where governments used to be depended on to solve the social ills of society. The second thing I'd like to share with you is that I don't believe that altruism, altruism is a role or domain of corporations. I think altruism is something that is the domain of individuals, whether you do or not. But... I think for corporations, uh, the difference between altruism and what we do, what we, I do and what we do, uh, you know, positive uh, things that we do for society, there needs to be something what I call a positive feedback cycle, meaning what we give and what we contribute to society needs to, in some way, come back to benefit the company. We need to receive for what we uh, give away in terms of our time and our resources you know, in, uh, because if we do that, if we do the right thing, because our brand recognition will improve, our uh, reputations will improve, hopefully business will improve, our turnovers will improve, profits will improve, and then that results in greater giving in the next cycle. 
So that has to continue, like Dr. Vinod said, because otherwise such giving, if it is not, doesn't have a positive return on investment, is not going to be uh, sustainable. And so the next round, it allows the corporation to return more and it becomes a virtuous cycle for feedback. And the third and final observation I'd like to make, and this is very personal from my own uh, uh, experience as a leader, I think a corporation's uh, contributions to society are most effective, most effective when they relate to the corporation's core purpose or core, uh, core values. You know, like what's what uh, somebody said, you're just writing checks uh, every when everyone asks you, that's not very sustainable. But if what you do and give your time and your money is relates to your core values and your core purpose, then it's a leverage, you know, because it's what you know best. So, for example, I don't believe an auto manufacturer should be they should be focusing on things like road safety or environmental protection. But if they start giving for, you know, teenage pregnancy or hunger, it doesn't relate to what they do as a business. And therefore, the positive cycle will not be as powerful. Um, uh, even in my organization, because we are a design firm, we have three key uh, areas of giving. Number one is design. So if students of design ask for grants to travel or study, that's where we give. Or number two, environment, any environmental cause, because as builders of the built environment, uh, that's an area that we contribute to. And lastly is education, because we find that the education is a channel for us to get great new uh, talent. So that is, we, we target our giving for areas which relate to what we do, um, you know, and it also relates to our, our core values. So I think that's very important to do. I think we have to focus what we do and what we give uh, so that it has a very positive return on investment so we can give more the next round. Excellent. Um, very, uh, sorry, we, we jumped on six different strands there. So uh, let's try to focus. I'm going to try to focus the uh, the questions in, in this, is this next, next little bit. Um, um, I think, David, you bring up a really important point at the beginning, which, which said that we were reaching the margins of, of capitalism in certain countries where, where the, the huge incremental gains that you might make are, are becoming less. And, and now we need to focus on social capitalism. There's a lot of politicians, especially in the developing world, who would argue that, yes, those incremental to, um, marks are being met in the West, but, but, but in the developing world, they're still not as further along on, on, on that path of capitalism. Why should they handicap their progress um, with altruistic models when the West never felt free to do so in their development in the 19th and early 20th century? Isn't it unfair to place a, the burden of, of in, you know, having to provide altruistic goals and means within their, their business setup when the West never cared to do the same 100 years ago? That's my question to that. Um, Lord Woolley, you... Uh, you talked about how important it is for companies to include a social structure, a social capitalism structure within their business model so that there can be sharing of, of, of profit and revenue for all because it's just the right thing to do. I completely agree with you. I wonder on a practical level what that would look like. Yeah. Conceptually, it sounds amazing, but in terms of tangential uh, – uh, or sorry um, – you know, uh, actual steps that companies can take, what would that entail and what would that look like? I think those, those two questions to start with okay. and then we'll, we'll keep going. Start with the, the, the last one first, because it speaks, to, it speaks to David's first point about business's role uh, in society, uh, almost above and beyond what uh, governments do. And sure. we, need look, we need look no further than the, than the global Black Lives Matter protests in which uh, the, that our societies were convulsed because they saw a black man murdered in front of our eyes. And they knew that this was systemic of uh, uh, systemic race inequality. The death was the extreme version of it. And businesses came to the fore and said, we have a role to play to tackle systemic race inequality. And that was against the Trump regime. That was against the Boris Johnson regime here in the UK. Business took the lead. And when you were asking, Carl, what are the tangibles? What does that greater equality look like? Business leaders said, look no further than our boards. And you will see how inequality works. Our mid-managers, our culture, 
the way that we do business uh, it, with with African uh, nations. Uh, you know, we could say, uh, and I've been saying this for some time, <clears throat> during that 18 month period, we had, commercially speaking, business speaking, some of the greatest conversations, the greatest conversations, uncomfortable conversations of race inequality, societal race inequality, including in business, ever. And this is what this is what social capitalism can do when you confront uncomfortable truths. What is our business predicated on? What well, I win and you lose? Exploitation. Or can we have a different model? And the, the great thing about it is, is that when you really lean into this, actually, you begin to unleash talent. You begin to multiply your potential creativity, productivity, a global reach. But you have to flip the switch. You have to reset your model to incorporate these things, not as an add-on, but as part of your DNA. I, I'll, I'll let Vinod, I'll let Vinod, the, the, the expert in, in regards to your first question, um, to, to confront that elephant in the room. <laughs> um, look, um, <laughs> yeah, you, you've got a point uh, uh, on, on, on the fact that why should third world support what's going on now uh, when the first was already done? And I spoke about this at the opening session with Frank. So let me repeat, you're, you're absolutely right. That's why we need a holistic solution because let's just look at the issue of climate change, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have the world telling Malaysia, we have, you know, the most ancient rainforest in the world and too much palm oil plantations. And please don't cut your rainforest down. They are the oxygen of the world. They're the lungs of the world. We need your rainforest, which is fair and right. But the only reason that it is the lungs of the world or one of the major lungs of the world is because the West have already destroyed their environment. All their woods are gone, all their trees are gone, everything is gone. And they've enriched themselves from industrialization. So it is absolutely fair to say, wait a minute, now you want us to stop? You know, when we're now just about to try and create, create wealth from our own resources? Now, the problem is, we absolutely have to stop. We have to save the trees, right? It, it's, it's, it's suicide if we don't. But also, come on there must be a sense of fair play. The world, even in globalization, must have a fair scorecard. So like golf, we need a handicap system. We need all countries to be handicapped. We can't treat Bangladesh the same way as we treat the UK. We can't treat Japan the same way as we treat Somalia. It just doesn't work. So each country needs a handicap that works within its socio-economic situation right and where the country is and then with that handicap system perhaps we then have a solution how it balances out how we can then say you can be altruistic now you can do this now for the rest of the world because it's been balanced out in some form because the handicap system allows you uh, a better a better trade uh preference preferential trade practice uh, here and there, and things like that. So we need holistic solutions, and there are there. It just it, it just requires people to sit down that are smart enough and work it out. Right. Look, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, let me put it bluntly. We live in a world today where we have simultaneous epidemics of both starvation and obesity, sometimes in the same country. Think about that. How ridiculous is that? And this is a reality, all right? It's just stupid. So we just need to realize we've been stupid. We've not got into this and we've not seriously sat down to find a solution. And that's all we need to. And if we all sat down, if the smart people of the world, the business leaders, the academics, the politicians, um, those policymakers can sit down and say, seriously, we need to solve this, we will, because it's there. We just have to work it out. I mean, we, we come up with solutions for far more complex situations in, in many, 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 many schemes. And I'll put it this way, as a final note, I, I, I've shared this with Simon and others before, so I'll share it with you now. You know, why I say business leaders must be involved is because I really think business leaders are 
some of the smartest people in the group. I mean, we take companies and, and we, we, you know, they're dying. We, we bring it back to life. You know, we, we, we rebrand it. We build it up. We re-employ people. We do amazing things with companies that think people have, have, have lost. Now, it's like having a, a dying duck, right? We have a dying duck. Well, business leaders have the best accountants in the world. They'll come in there and fix the bones and arteries and re refresh blood through this dying duck. And then we have the best lawyers in the world. They'll look at the dying duck and certify that this formerly dying duck is now alive and well. And then we have the best communication PR people around that will now show the world this formerly dying duck is not just alive and well, it's laying golden eggs. Now, <laughs> if you could take a small percentage of that ingenuity and used it on a societal problem, on societal development, on trying to find this holistic solution, imagine what's possible. So we just need to get these people to sit down and talk. And actually, look, you know, you um, a Gra Graham, I think Graham has something to add to the, the golden egg <laughs> metaphor. Um, well, I think, I don't have anything to add to that, but I think I, I agree with what Atuk Villa said, that we can solve these problems. And we wrote a blog article recently on, some of you may have heard of this, and if you don't know about it, go and Google it. It's, it's relatively easy to understand. Something called the prisoner's dilemma, where effectively if you put two people into conflict, the best thing for them to do is just to defect from it, both basically try and screw each other. But if you can get them to cooperate, then great things happen. And it was the prisoner's dilemma. It was a, um, come up by Nat John Nash, a famous mathematician, years ago. The good thing about the prisoner's dilemma is that it can be applied to lots of different scenarios. So it's effectively the prisoner's dilemma that stopped the Cold War um, blowing up into a nuclear war because neither of them would, they had to cooperate. Because if one of them defected and pressed the button, then the other side would press the button and then, you know, we wouldn't be here talking about this. And one of the things that we've spoken about in social capitalism, I said it's got to be socially unacceptable. But if I'm running a company and I'm a good social capitalist, everyone else can say, well, that's OK, because Graham's company is supporting the rest of the world or is doing this. And we need everyone to do that. We need everybody to cooperate. And one way we can do that is call on, as has been not said, come call on the academics who understand this sort of mathematical basis and get them to work out how we can apply social capitalism and the prisoner's dilemma to make companies cooperate, force them to cooperate. Because actually, if you look at the prisoner's dilemma, cooperation is the best way to achieve everybody's end goals. Defection is no good for anybody in the long run. Um, so you know, I would encourage people to look at that and think in that mindset um, when looking at how we can address this problem. It's, it's, an, in, it's an interesting thought. I mean, it, it goes back to also the First World War where... Um... Um, you, you had the, the Christmas truce, and, and if everyone had just figured out during the Christmas truce, if everyone just laid down arms, there would be no more war. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's that didn't happen. So there's lots of interesting examples, because that's a good one. Everyone knows that. The yeah. other one is there's certain fish which clean the um, teeth of sharks. Yeah. And the sharks let them go in and clean the teeth on the promise they won't eat them. If the sharks were short term, they'd just eat the fish, but then their <laughs> teeth would fall out and they wouldn't be able to eat anything anymore. Other fish that don't clean the teeth, they'll just eat. <laughs> also a good example, I suppose. Um, the floor is now open. We're, we're reading towards the end of the session, so the floor is open. The, yeah, it's, it's no golden duck. Um, the floor is now open to uh, questions, so if anyone has questions, just play, um, press your raise your hand button, and I will call on you, time permitting. Um, let me be the first to ask a, a question um, to the panel. Let's say um, that all four of you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, capitalism has led to gross in, um, income and wealth inequality in the world. The rich are getting richer, the poor are get, getting poorer. If I may play devil's advocate for, for another moment, um, if we rewind back 500 years, 1,000 years, 1,500 years, wealth and, and, and income inequality was even more spread out um, even wider, the, 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 the income gap, the wealth gap was even wider because all the money and all the wealth in the world were concentrated in the hands of, of princes and kings and emperors. Um, the poor had l less than nothing until the embracement of capitalism 200, 300 years ago at the, um, with the beginning of the Enlightenment. So given that the trajectory of the world is towards bridging in income inequality, 
with the free market empowering workers, empowering corporations, are we not already on the right track? Do we need something called social capitalism to ac accentuate and catalyze this further? Okay. Obviously, I may not believe everything I just said, but I think it's worth uh, bringing up. So, um, we, Graham raise his hand first, and then we'll go around the hall. <laughs> I, I would just say that there's a fantastic quote that was made in 2010 that said, "The world is changing. The world is changing so fast that it will not never be this um, slow again." So, I think you're right. Capitalism is moving the world forward, but the world is moving forward faster than capitalism. Now, capitalism is able to keep up with that, and um, you know, bring everyone into um, in, into line, into the same thing. So you, you're right, it is moving, but it's not moving as fast as the world itself is moving. Can I just jump in and make a point that, number one, I don't yeah. think capitalism, firstly, capitalism didn't appear a couple of hundred years ago. Capitalism has been around for thousands of years. As long as there's been trade, there's been capitalism. As long as the caveman wanted to exchange his, you know, stone for some, you know, grass, there was capitalism. So the issue is, what has capitalism evolved into? I think the only answer is there, it's just the definition of capitalism. I, I, all I'm saying is, I believe true capitalism, capitalism as, def, as it should be defined, is social capitalism. We can so shall, we, shall we call it the free market then? Is it a free market? It's not a free market. No, no, it's no, no, a no, move no, towards no, free market. We don't care about no, that. We, I think we need a reality check here. And the reality check is, is that the, the, the capitalism that has been, that has been uh, rolled out over the past 500 years is, is one of exploitation. And the building blocks, the building blocks of present day capitalism has meant that certain countries and resources are locked in, mm. and uh, for many others, they are they are systematically locked out. Uh, we we should be ashamed that some of the most resource rich countries on the planet are simultaneously the poorest. So let's have a reality check in a kind of a pseudo intellectual discussion uh, that that forgets about people's lives. Mm. And by the way, we just got spanked by Lord <laughs> and, and the poverty and the and the poverty trap uh, that they will be in for many decades unless we do something about it. This is an opportunity. This is a this is a, our time to, to to reset how we do business for the sake of humanity. Mm -hmm. and what we say, we still we can we can still make profit. Yeah, and it uh, doesn't, I, I think you're right, Simon. It doesn't actually mean sacrificing too much it just means thinking about how we're doing what we're doing and the people around us and the community around us it's tempering greed you know? it's just I, I don't think that social capitalism is some sort of altruistic version of capitalism at all i think social capital capitalism is an enlightened version of capitalism it is still absolute capitalism remember what i said earlier we mm. give we corporations give strategically because we want it to come back to us. It's still selfishness at its root, perhaps, but it's not altruism, which is different, right? Right. It, it, it's about self-improvement. And in that respect, going back to what Cod asked earlier, is do third world countries, should they, should they be expected to, to um, behave with social capitalist uh, you know, activity? And my answer is the smart capitalist will. I don't care whether you're a tailor in a slum in Mumbai or a oil dealer in, uh, in Russia, right? If you're smart and you know that you live within a community, whether it's a global community or, or the community of uh, Dubiwala, that you'll be smart. If you give back in some way, it will help your brand, your company. And the more you give to the society and the community, even if it's just a few hovels around you, it will help your business. So is that altruistic? No, 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 no. It's smart. It's capitalism, but enlightened capitalism. And it can work in India. It can work uh, in every developed country in the world and across the world. It's not restricted to some, you know, first world countries which have made it. No, I don't think so. It operates everywhere.
And, and David, I, I want to go back to a point that you actually made earlier, which is that businesses um, for the past so-and-so years have been the engines of positive change rather than governments. I mean, we come from a region of the world where our governments aren't necessarily um, the most evolutionary, um, are, 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 are on the cutting edge of, of intellect or, 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 or respect for rights and, and freedoms. How, how do we empower corporations to go beyond the restrictions imposed by the government, let's say on, on, on issues like working hours, minimum wage, investment in environment where the government doesn't place priority in these things, but how do we engender um, companies to go beyond their government's mandates and actually embrace these these ideas that are heavily a part of social capitalism. For example, we shouldn't be expecting our government to mandate more, uh, more. If uh, anything, they mandate less and less every day in this region right. of the world. But the companies that see the the improved governance that is achieved by giving more medical leave for mothers or uh, paternal leave for fathers, what they will find, and this is what we do. And, what we, mm. and I don't do it because I'm I'm selfless. Uh, caught. I don't do it because I'm altruistic. I do it because that's how I get the best talent. Simple. Is it self-interest? Of course, I don't go around shouting. I'm. I'm. It's just for self-interest. I let. I let the ecosystem decide. I mean, let's put it with my the group as well. Right now, what David's done, and we've worked with him. My team has done, and he does a lot of it uh, through his system. We've done the same. So, I think the idea that I think this is the problem. Cod, what you're talking about is Asian companies, or at least our region in Southeast Asia, we've mm. become too used to government projects, government mandated projects, government supported projects. And we're always looking to do business that is then mandated or supported by or blessed by the government. Now, that, that is inherently wrong for any kind of business, right? As entrepreneurs, we just do business. We look for smart business. We look for long-term growth and I believe in the areas that you're talking about, and the world is going in that direction, mm. uh, sustainability, et cetera. I mean, you know, we have a company called Green Rubber. It's the it's world's only recycling process for, for, for waste rubber, the world's number one environmental asset. Now, that in itself, right, already makes us a hit everywhere else. You know, people want it. People demand it. So when, you're, when you go into certain industries and the, the, where the world is already moving in that direction, business leaders can push things forward more aggressively for their own market. So if we start then changing that conversation globally and within our country, we don't need the government to participate. Now, this is not this is nothing to politi- politics. We're not saying change government. We're not saying, oh, we want this policy, that policy. It's got nothing to do with that. We're just dealing with pure business and economics. And I think when we look at it from that perspective, that's how change occurs. And that's how business leaders can make that change. That's a great note to sort of wind down. Um, um, I'd ask for a uh, a, maybe a closing 60 seconds from every uh, panelist. And then barring any questions, I don't think there is any um, so far. um, We can uh, wrap things up because we are now over time. So I'll jump right in. I'm I'm excited about what can be achieved. I I just hope that there's the political will uh, from primarily the business community but also wider society, the education institutions, uh, and some governments leaning into this. It it is absolutely not I win and you lose. I think we get this right. I win, we all all win. And actually, we owe it. We owe it to ourselves when we get up in the morning and say, what is my role in society? Is it just about making a fast buck? Or can we be bigger and better for uh, the improvement of our global society? So I'm, I'm, I'm honoured. I'm honoured to be on this panel. With, with next time, I think we need more gender balance. I'm not going to lie. Uh, 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 but we're, we're not responsible for the picking of the panel, unfortunately. No, I do agree with you. Um, uh, but this is a conversation that will grow and grow, and I'm happy to be part of it. Vinod, do you want to go next? Um, I think you know Simon said. I mean, he really summed it up all well in terms of what we all represent and want to do. Um, I would just say we must stop looking at making a change, making a difference with being altruistic, as David said earlier. It's not about wearing a hair shirt. It's not about sacrifice. Look, I like my toys. I worked hard. 
and I like the toys I can buy with the money I've earned. But the point is, if I'm smart enough to do all that, if I'm smart enough to make this money, surely I'm smart enough to impact lives and make a difference as I make this money. Uh, and that's not just a throwaway line. Very simplistically, it's about making an effort to make a difference. And if all business leaders, if all, if everyone really, anyone in business, anyone in a company decided to do something, anything, if you can't afford something, some time, if you have one hour a week tuition for the neighbor's child who who's might fail his exams if his maths doesn't improve, anything. But if everyone did something, <coughs> in whatever amount, in whatever way, the world changes and it changes permanently. So for me, what we're discussing today is about businesses changing, evolving, taking the next step in the human evolutionary process to say what is economic for the future? What is what what should humanity now be represented as when we when we grow, when we when we develop? It is really now evolving who we are and what we are uh, as business leaders and as, as a business to redefine how economics works in the world. And that's why the discussion is so, so critical. Uh, because now is the time. The pandemic has shown us why it's so important, where our weaknesses are. And we have an opportunity now to actually get involved and fix it and find solutions. You know, it's all incremental. And it doesn't matter if we only move an inch forward. An inch forward is an inch forward, as long as we're moving forward. And we just have to keep doing that. David, do you want to go next? I think if you look at the um, the most successful or influential corporations in the world and you scratched under the surface, you'd, you'd detect that they all have something in common, which is that profit is not their bottom line, that they have some deeper purpose, a deeper purpose which gives them direction, gives them, gives their staff some sort of motivation and uh, wait, make, makes people wake up in the morning and want to do the best they can, having a deeper sense of, pur of purpose. And that's what I try to do in, in my organization. Um, uh, companies that are only about the bottom line do not motivate uh, their employees. And uh, as the competition for talent becomes greater, they will migrate to companies which give them a sense of fulfillment. And hopefully that's what I've done here in my company. And I think, the, you know, if that becomes a model and an example for companies around the world, and I say not just in the first world, it happens, it's the same rule in everywhere in the world, then hopefully we'll all move in the right direction and make a better world for all. Graham? Yeah, I would encourage everyone on this panel and anyone who listens to this talk afterwards. Uh, to get involved in this conversation because if you don't you're just going to get the likes of us preaching our views as well for the rest of the rest of eternity myself and Vinod and some other people from we're based in Kuala Lumpur at the moment will be with Lord Woolley on Monday next week we're traveling over the weekend to start a conversation with a select group of people um, about what the good capitalism forum this thing that I'm chief executive of that's going to be run next um, next Easter, April the 11th to the 15th in Cambridge at Homerton College. Um, and we're going to start the conversation about what should we talk about at that Good Capitalism Forum? Because if no one tells us, we're going to talk about this again and again and again. And you're going to hear me talk about the prisoner's dilemma and Vin will talk about a dying duck. And I'm guessing <laughs> by the next week we won't want to hear that. So we're going to start that conversation on Monday. We've got a launch event at Homerton College in August, and then we'll have the main event next Easter. If you want to get involved in that, if you want to give me your views, if you want to discuss anything, Google my name or go through Frank, you'll find my name, get in contact, and then we keep in contact with you. But get engaged because we need, otherwise you're just going to listen to us for the next five years. And I'm guessing none of us really want that. Excellent. Um, I'd like to thank the panel for allowing me to play the antagonist today and, and sort of challenge your views. But, but let me just say that as a journalist, having worked in the Middle East and, and in the Far East now for the, the better part of a decade, um, that the challenges that are represented in this region require the cooperation, the investment, 
the time and the energy of, of everyone, including big businesses, especially big businesses. In, a, in an area of the world where um, companies are increasing, or governments are increasingly totalitarian, um, protectionist, and, 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 and against the rights of, of everyday people, um, we, need, we need companies to further their message, to increase their social capital, to become big hiring agencies for creativity. Otherwise, we're going to see a brain drain and see the best and brightest of us leave for abroad. So thank you for, for, for all my fellow panelists for, for the work that not only for not only participating in the panel, but also the work they do in the field in trying to keep the talent within this region of the world through good hiring practices, through competitive hiring practices, and through social innovation. Um, thank you for Harassis and Frank um, for hosting us. Hopefully we can meet in person for the first time in three years this November in, in Vietnam um, for those who will be attending. Um, for everyone else that joined our panel today, thank you. Um, I hope you took something away from this and I hope you attend other sessions at Harassis. And thank you again to my esteemed panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are we offline? Yep, we're stopping.